It is great to see you this morning. It is a great day to be in God's house. It's a great day to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're a guest here this morning, I want to welcome you and thank you for being here. My name is Matt Atwell. I am the associate pastor at Riviera Baptist Church. And uh, before we get started, I just uh, want to pray for us. God, thank you so much for being here, Lord. There truly is no one like our God, especially the God of ourselves. Uh, there are so many things out there that try to be our gods, but it is you. No one can save except for you. And we thank you. We ask that you would come powerfully upon this place today, that your spirit would just do amazing works. God, as we, we seek to transform our minds and our hearts and our lives, we let your word do that. And we invite, we invite that here today, God. We, we ask for it. We ask this thing, these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. So, last week, we started a series on biblical conversion. And last week was focused on the parable of the sower, and how in that parable there were four seeds. And, but only one of those four seeds was actually a true convert, actually a true disciple of Christ. And it was the one that produced fruit. And yet, there were two seeds in that parable that were examples of how someone can make a decision to become a Christian, quote-unquote, but they did not actually become disciples of Christ. And we also looked at several other scriptures as we walked through a portion of the sermon called the, that I called the Nine Marks of Examination. And the point of that was to help us understand well, so if we're trying to examine ourselves the way that Paul told the Corinthians to do, then how do we do that? And what does the Bible actually say we should see in the life of a true convert? What should we see in our lives? And one of the things I failed to do last week um, was mention that during that, that portion, there was a lot of inspiration that came from this really great book called Are You, Am I Really a Christian by Mike McKinley. And my mind was just moving so fast, it was up here with me. Just totally forgot to mention it. But this week, we're moving forward on biblical conversion as we look at the process of salvation. And so I want to start with a question. Have you ever started something and thought it was finished, but then you realized that it wasn't finished? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you started a project at home. And you thought that it was finished, and then every time you think it's finished, you find something else that has to be done. Maybe uh, you were making plans for vacation, and every time you thought you were finished planning for vacation, you discovered something else that you forgot. Maybe you were trying to pay off a debt, and every time you thought you were done, you realized that you weren't finished. Maybe you got married. Oh. And you thought, ah, oh, I'm done with dating. And then you realize, I need to date my spouse. <laughs> right? Well, maybe there was a time in your life when you got saved. And you thought, all right, that's it. I'm done. I've, I've done my repentance. I've got my get out of hell card. And now I just have to sit and wait for him. Well, I'm going to tell, I'm going to show us in God's word this morning that when we truly repent and put our faith in Christ, our salvation is, has only just begun. It is a process. God is not done with us. And we remember last week we started with a video about some people's testimonies. And they told us about their decision that they had made to follow Christ. But the video ended with, but. They all said, but. Well, now we're going to see what else they have to say. Led in the sinner's prayer. But. 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 The whole time that I'm pastoring and preaching and traveling and I've gone overseas and I'm doing the work of the ministry, uh, full 
fledged into the ministry, my heart is deceitful and wicked. I'm desiring things that are ungodly. I'm spending much time on the internet, which led to other sins that caused me to have to resign from my position as a pastor. I had served in the church, and that made me okay. I was the mother of three and a wife, but not living the life of a wife and of a mother, not living the life of a Christian woman. Let me tell you about the next 16, 17 years of my life. Being a Christian, I should have had the um, fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience. Um, what, I, what I lived the, the next 16, 17 years of my life, you'd have to back up to verse 19 where it talks about sexual immorality, drunkenness, being completely uh, self-centered. Um, everything was about me. And my brother-in-law was uh, my best friend. And he started asking me one night when we were working out, he said, are you sure that you're a Christian? And I said, oh, man, I, yeah, five years old, I took care of that. Six months later, I was in this uh, class, Bible study at my church called Personal Holiness. And then my life began to change. Um, I started reading my Bible for the first time in my life. And uh, I think it was First Peter said, Be holy, for I am holy. And that really bothered me that week. And the next week I read the scripture, Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not the things I say. And the more I read it, the more I had a problem. The thing I always depended on, that I was a, the good boy that everybody thought I was. The more God's Word was put in my heart, the more I realized I wasn't who I always thought I was. I remember it so clearly that God brought to my mind the book of 1 John. I just sat there and I read the whole book of 1 John that night. And, and that night I made up my mind and if God's word was true, I was lost. If I'm living in darkness and walking in darkness and not living in light, I'm lost. Under deep conviction, I called out to God. I received a relationship that I had never had before. Taking care of the sin issues that were in my heart. God showed me that I wasn't saved. Everything that I had thought was making me saved wasn't. So last week, we saw that all these people had made a decision to become a Christian, but, and then we see what was happening, there was something missing in their life, right? And, and they noticed what was missing. They weren't, it was their sanctification. It was missing. They weren't growing in Christ. They weren't becoming more and more like Christ. And they realized that. And it was the absence of sanctification that showed them that they didn't actually know God. They did not actually have a relationship with Jesus. And so, see, salvation is a process. It is a process that takes eons. Three eons, to be precise. It starts with justification eon. Um, proceeds to sanctification eon and then culminates with glorification eon. Right? And justification is just the beginning. It's, it's when we move from death to life. It's, it's the beginning of the process. As Paul says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the tense that Paul uses here. We have been justified. He's talking about something that has happened in a believer's life. There's a point in time when there is a decision that has to be made. And that is the decision to repent and to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. To repent and accept what He's done on the cross. 
as the gift. And it happens. And again, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Again, the have been. You have been saved. He's talking about this justification. See, justification is not a process. It happens at a point in time in someone's life. And that point in time is when... We, in true faith and repentance, we tell God, guilty, and God declares, not guilty, by the blood of Jesus. And it is not by works. We cannot earn it. We cannot work for it. We cannot pull ourselves up the rope. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Period. But God's not done with us. Once that justification happens, it's beginning a process. And Paul talks about that process in Ephesians, just the very next two verses. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, this is the walking in Christ, the abiding in Christ, the becoming more and more like Christ. And this is where works come in, not as, as a way to earn our salvation, but as a true, as the fruit of a true, genuine conversion. I think James says it really well in James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. <coughs> show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I think he sums it up well in verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And then the question comes up, well, is James teaching a self-justification of salvation by works? No. He's just teaching what true faith results in. He agrees that it's only by the blood of Christ that we can be saved. But he also agrees with the Bible's definition of faith, which means obedience. Okay, and so, if, if I get some, what James is saying up, I would say it this way, a faith without works is a faith that doesn't work. But a faith with works is a faith that works. Right? Are you with me this morning? Am I making sense? So we were saved when we were justified, and we're being saved as we're being sanctified. We can see, we can see this in Philippians 3. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is talking about the Christian life. And the Christian life is one of walking towards Christ. The Christian life is one of sanctification. We're headed towards something. And then the question becomes, though, what is, exactly is Paul headed towards? What is this prize? What is this end goal? And he tells us, just a little bit later in verses 20 and 21, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so that is our glorification. Do you see that? Paul is looking forward to a time when one day he will be rid of sin completely and will be glorified, will be completely perfected. Okay, and so if I could break this together, and this is where your notes start. If you've got your notes, this is where we're starting here. We've got, oh, here we go. 
See, justification means I have been saved from the penalty of my sin. Okay? That's a past thing for a believer. Sanctification means I am being saved from the burden of my sin. Slowly but surely, I'm becoming more and more like Christ, and all those sins that I was enslaved to are falling off. <coughs> Glorification means I will be saved from the nature of my sin. So one day, I'll be completely rid of it. Praise God. And this is the road. This is the process that every true believer is in. Okay, we're all on this road. We're all on this process. Now, it doesn't look the same for everybody. It looks different. And, you know, here's the thing. Justification is easy enough, right? It, I mean, it takes humility, but we don't work for it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Glorification, that's real easy. It's this middle part, this sanctification part, that's hard. That's where things get difficult. And that's, that, that's where we pursue God. And that's where we also work. And He works in us. And He sanctifies us. And that's the road that every believer is on. And it's the difficult road. As we see in Matthew 7, 13 through 14 which is where I should have two volunteers coming up. I've got two volunteers who should be on their way. <laughs> you guys go ahead and start as, as I read this. You go ahead and just do your thing. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I have a couple of volunteers who are helping me illustrate this. You see, one of them is drawing the road to destruction. And this road is wide, and it's nice, and it's smooth, and it's paved, and it's straight. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the road that you, from all human perspective, this is the road you would want to be on. Okay? It, it, if you're done, you, yeah, you can sit down. And then there's this road. And it's not wide. In fact, it's narrow. And it's not paved. And in fact, it's not smooth at all. It's difficult. There's all kinds of obstacles. There's all kinds of holes. There's all kinds of difficulties. From all human perspective, this is not the road you would want to be on. This is the road you would want to stay away from, and this is the one you would want to be on. But the kicker is the destination. Because this road leads to destruction, and this road leads to life. And so the question becomes, are we on a cruise to hell or a battleship to heaven. And what is so what is so astounding about what Jesus says here? These are the only two options. There is no easy road to heaven. There's no easy road that lands at the gate to life. But people don't like that. They don't like that. And here's what they do instead. They say, you know what? I, I'm not sure I like that. I want to walk an easy road, but I want to end up at the gate that goes to life. And so here's what people do instead. They start making up a third road. And, and this road that they start making up, it's not quite as wide and easy as this one, but it's also definitely not as narrow and difficult like that one. And so, and most of the time, when people walk this road, for their whole life, it stays really close to this road over here. But then something really interesting happens at the very end. This is fascinating. At the very end of their life, this road all of a sudden takes this really sharp turn and just heads over to the gates of life. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Wow! 
there's a road that we can take in which we obey Jesus a little bit, but we get to hold on to the American dream, and we get to continue to practice the sins that we just don't want to get rid of, and we get to keep control of our lives, but then at the end, whew, all of a sudden, we get into heaven. Wow! <coughs> But there's one problem. Jesus doesn't give us that option. Jesus said, you're either on this road or you're on this road. This one's easy, this one's hard. He draws a line like he does so often. You only get one master, it's either me or it's not. This is the road of the notorious, lukewarm Christian that we read about in Revelation 3, 14 through 16. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You'll notice that this is written to a church, but it's actually not really a church. It is a group of false converts. I mean, that's what this passage tells us. Uh, John Carthy says it this way, The church in Laodicea was neither cold, openly rejecting Christ, nor hot, filled with spiritual zeal. Instead, its members were lukewarm, hypocrites, professing to know Christ, but not truly belonging to him. When Francis Chan wrote his book, Crazy Love, he studied God's Word to try to figure out, is there, is there such a thing as a lukewarm Christian? Is that a thing? Does the Bible give that as an option? And here's what he had to say. Chapter 5 was definitely the most difficult chapter for me to write. Um, because... It's almost like I wish it weren't true. Because in chapter 5 I talk about lukewarm Christianity and basically my conclusion is there's no such thing. I mean when Jesus talks about the lukewarm person he's saying I'm going to spit that person out of my mouth and he makes it so clear because that person's not a true follower of mine. And so this whole idea of being a lukewarm Christian really is an oxymoron. When I read the Bible, I don't see that Jesus gives us room to say that we're Christians and yet not truly follow him. And that scares me. I mean, it's not something where I'm being judgmental towards another person or even toward myself. I just go, man, that's, that's a scary thought. I think there are a lot of us in the world who call ourselves Christians and yet we don't really follow his ways and somehow we've made it so that that's okay that there are the true disciples and followers, and then there are these Christians. You know, Christians are people who believe in Jesus, but their lives don't really change a whole lot, but they're still saved. And I'm going, well, I don't see that there's room for that in Scripture. I mean, I wish there were, because like I said, it saddens me because I think of people in my life that I really care about, that call themselves Christians, and yet they don't really follow Jesus. And this isn't about my opinion. I mean, when you, read the, when you read the Bible yourself, do you really see that there's room for a person who calls himself a Christian but is not a follower? Does that really make sense to you that there could be a person who doesn't really obey the commands of Jesus Christ yet is truly a saved Christian? See, when I read it, I go, no way. The Bible is clear. He says, if anyone calls himself a believer, and yet doesn't obey his commands, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Judge for yourself. Um, this isn't about me or one guy's interpretation, but try to read the Bible literally. Try to look at these passages objectively and ask yourself, have I been fed this idea of a person being a Christian who doesn't follow Jesus? Or is it true that there's no such thing as a lukewarm Christian? I share his sentiments. 
And I would, I would tell him, I would tell you the same thing. Like, look at Scripture and judge for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take his word for it. Look at Scripture. Because I, when I read it, I, the one problem I see, I think, well, there's many problems, but there's no third road. You see, a person who has justification has taken the on-ramp to the road of sanctification that leads to glorification. God doesn't give us justification and glorification and say, hey, you can skip this part. You can skip the road of sanctification. This is the road that leads to life. Because if that were true, if we could skip that road. If we could be a lukewarm Christian, then it would also be true that God's spirit inside of you could fail. That means if you can be filled with the spirit and not produce the fruit of the spirit, then that means that God's spirit has failed and is ineffective. That's like saying you can go stuff your stomach with food all the time and never poop. <laughs> filled with food equals poop filled with spirit equals fruit my food has never failed to produce poop <laughs> my spirit the Holy Spirit inside of me has never failed to produce fruit he doesn't now we can talk about abnormal cases, like someone repenting shortly before their death. You know, and in that case, it's true, this, this road, it gets cut really short, right? And it gets really itty-bitty, and you might even be hard to see it. And we don't deny the possibility of that, and we, we praise God when it happens. But for most of us, we have more time on the road of sanctification. And like I said before, this road, it does look different for each person, okay? And some people walk it at different paces, but it is the road that we are on. We, don't, we can't get around that. And so what I want to do now is move again into some uh, a section that's about examination, okay? Because we remember 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when Paul told, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And so... I want us to be able to think through, okay, how, how can I tell if maybe I am a lukewarm Christian that God's going to spit out of his mouth? How can I tell if I'm someone who's on this third road? But we remember, there's actually no one on that road, right? Because it is imaginary. And so, we're going to go into this section. A person on the third road is often someone who... And I say often because nothing like this is ever exhaustive or definitive, but it is helpful for us to think about, for us to examine our hearts. Okay, and, and I also want to throw uh, credit out to Michael Lawrence. I, I showed you guys that book on conversion last week. A lot of the inspiration came from that book in this part of the sermon. But let's get right into it. A person on the third row is often someone who is excited about heaven, but bored by Christians in the local church. When we get to the mark of church membership in this series, one of the things that we're going to see is that when we enter a, when we repent and put our faith in Christ, we do not only enter a relationship with Christ, but we enter a relationship with His people. We are saved into a community, and Jesus loves His church. Jesus loves His bride. And so for somebody to say that they have the love of Jesus in them, but they don't love the things that Jesus loves, that's cause to pause and to think, what's really going on inside? What's really going on? Is there something that I need to fix, or is there a possibility that maybe I don't actually know Christ because I hate His church, and I'm not interested in partnering with His people to accomplish the things that He's told me to do? So there's reason for pause there, for concern. And this ties really well with the second one. Someone on the third road thinks heaven will be great whether God is there or not. And to illustrate this, I have a good old country music video for you this morning. <laughs> oh boy. 
don't think we're going to be adding that one to the rotation anytime soon, are we, Lane? <laughs> hey, God, you know that mansion you prepared for me? I mean, thanks and all. Can I have this instead? Hey, God, you know what I need, and it's not you. It's green grass and dirt roads. See, a true convert, someone who really is excited about heaven because they know Christ, they're not excited because of the mansion. They're excited because of the master. God is what makes heaven heaven. If you take God out of heaven, then you're in hell. He is the light at the end of the tunnel. And I am excited because Jesus is going to be there. Are you excited? Amen. Someone on the third road likes Jesus but didn't sign up for the rest. Obedience, holiness, discipleship, suffering. They like Jesus but they don't want to be like Jesus. But Jesus told us what it looks like to follow in his footsteps. Luke 9, 23 and 24, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. If, if I could say it simply, when we sign up for Christ, we sign up for his cross. You see, Jesus was presenting himself to these people. They didn't even know him yet. These weren't fault. He's, he's saying to all. He's, he's not presenting himself as Savior, but not Lord. He's like, hey, if you want to follow me, here's what you're in for. Yes, I'll be your Savior, but I'm going to be your Lord too. And he didn't present himself in any other way. And neither should we present him in any other way. And it's true that we don't have control over if false converts are created. We don't have complete control over that, but goodness, we should be concerned to try to keep it from happening. We don't want people to be like, oh yeah, I know Jesus now, and then we talk to them about the Lord part, and they're like, oh, I didn't sign up for that. You know? We want to try to keep that from happening. We don't want that to happen in our own lives. Number something. Someone on the third road, what is it, four, can't tell the difference between legalism and obedience motivated by love. You know, I believe in the pursuit of holiness. I, that, that is what God has called us to. But so often when you start to pursue holiness, people just want to scream, legalism. Anytime you want to hold someone accountable to God's word, anytime you want to raise the standards of the Christian life, and it's just legalism, legalism. You know, Jesus, he had a lot of problems with the Pharisees. His problem was not that they obeyed God's word, but they added to it. And their biggest problem was that their motivation for obedience was their own glory instead of the glory of God. But a true disciple. See, I want myself and for you and for all of our brothers and sisters all over the world to be obedient to God because that is what glorifies our Savior. It is out of love for him. I like what Bert Parsons said. The ironic thing about legalism is that it doesn't make people want to work harder. It makes them want to give up. And that's true. If our heart, if our obedience is not out of love, then legalism will not endure all things. But obedience, motivated by love for Christ, it will endure all things. It will press forward. But it's not legalism to hold one another accountable to God's word. You know, covenant church membership supported by scriptures is not legalism. Church discipline is not legalism. But lukewarm <laughs> Christianity sees it that way. Third row Christianity cannot tell the difference. And so quickly, accountability means judgmentalism. Holiness means uh. hatred, and truth means closed-minded. And we'll also 
also see that someone on the third road is bothered by other people's sins more than their own. You see, this is the balance with accountability and discipline, right? We're reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 7, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say that you're, to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Yeah. You see, a true disciple is bothered by sin no matter where it is. But they're bothered most by their own sin. I hate what New York did last month. I hate the Oregon laws on abortion. But I do not grieve those things as much as when I personally sin against my Savior. When I personally take the hammer and drive the nail. That's what weighs most heavily. Those are the things that I feel the most. And a true convert feels their own sins. But, but a, a person on the third road, you know, a lukewarm Christian, they're not going to feel the weight of their own sins that way. And they're going to be the kind of person who tries to take the speck out when there's a log in their own eye. Someone on the third road holds grace cheap and their own comfort costly. You know, we've talked about cheap grace, and we've seen from Scripture today that the road that we have chosen is the difficult road. Grace is expensive. It costs Jesus his life. And our comfort is not worth our soul. We just read Luke 9, 23, and 24, but here's verse 25. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Does this mean that we earn heaven by forfeiting our comforts? No. It means what Jesus just said, that a true disciple denies himself. You see, our salvation doesn't give us freedom to sin. It gives us freedom from sin. And so I hope this has helped clear some things up this morning. You know, this is a series. It's not a series on how do you lose your salvation, because we don't believe that. It's a series on... Conversion. How can we maybe examine ourselves to see, because there's, there's a reality, there's a lot of false converts. That's a reality. The Bible paints that picture very clearly. And I don't want any of us to be on this road when we think we're on this one. See, this, our sanctification proves the reality of our justification. Now, does that mean that we, that we work for our salvation? No. It doesn't mean that I earn it. I stand on the work of Christ and His work alone. I stand on the promises, on His promises. And I am sure of this, that He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. My God does not fail. This is why there's no such thing as an ex-Christian. Somebody says, I used to be a Christian. No, you didn't. That's impossible. If you used to be a Christian, then the Holy Spirit used to be effective. <laughs> if you used to be a Christian, then God has failed to complete the good work that He started in you. And my God does not fail. And so we have taken this road of sanctification, this difficult road, Road and God changes us. He makes us more and more like Himself. And I wanted to end today with an opportunity to, to just share together. To just share. And, and, and I want to give people an opportunity. We don't even have to use a mic. I just want to hear from you. Would you do you agree that God changes you? That a relationship with Christ changes you? Amen. Amen. Well, tell me, how has God changed you? How has God changed you? Patience. Patience. Self-control. Self-control. Sometimes. What's that? Sometimes. Sometimes. Understanding. Okay. 
It's like putting on glasses, right? <laughs> You've been living this, this whole life, and it's like you, you needed glasses, and you didn't even know it. And then you get saved. Rob? It was giving up some things, but he treated yeah. my anger for his joy. Amen. It, it was more of a trade. Amen. But first I had to choose. Yeah. And then God had an action. I will trade you your anger for my joy. Hallelujah. How has God changed you? What has he done? Jim? New want to. Okay. New desires. You know, you, you, you use the word burden there. And I know when we, look, we think about the road of sanctification, we're like, this is hard. But didn't Jesus say, my yoke is easy, my burden is light? Sanctification is hard, but you know what? It does make life a heck of a lot better. Yeah. How has God changed you? He gave me life. He gave you life. He gave me the ability to love others. Oh, yes. True love, right? Not artificial surface level love. How has God changed you? I love truth. Help me understand I have the Holy Spirit to Amen. guide me when, when I want my own way. And here I hear God's speaking. So I'm not alone. Oh, yes. He's given you... Oh, I'm losing words in my head. He, he sent us a helper. The Holy Spirit. You said you love truth. What did you use to love? The other thing. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Forgiveness. 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 Amen. You traded my pride and gave me humility to be able to admit my wrong, Amen. my faults, and ask forgiveness. Of Amen. Amen. No. Made me realize how much I need him. Yes. Yes. Jim. Every good thing comes from heaven. Nothing that belongs to me, it all belongs to God. Amen. I don't own that truck out there. Yes. I don't own that home I live in. I own nothing. I'm just a steward. That's right. That's what we're trying to teach our kids. We thank God for everything. Because mom and dad didn't get you this. Dad, your heavenly father did. Every good thing is from him. Anybody else? Healing. Healing. Identity and purpose. Amen. Truth. Isn't this wonderful? God is changing us. And if we don't do it alone, do we? We do it together. We are not on a cruise to heaven. We're on a battleship. But he's given us brothers and sisters in Christ to be on the battlefield right next to us. And praise God. God is changing us. My, our brother Andy Owen, he couldn't be here this morning. He was actually going to share a little bit. He told me a little bit this morning, and he said, you can share on my behalf if you want. He was talking about how God sanctified him, which we, we've already heard many ways in which God has sanctified him. He, he's working on him. But he was talking about how, you know, they have a new baby. They have downstairs neighbors. And even without a new baby, this would be bad enough. But they have down. People right below them who party all night, often and loud. I think the old, I think we would be trying to find a defense lawyer for Andy if, if he was the old Andy. Because I think he might have killed somebody. <laughs> but he hasn't. He's, he's working through that because, you know, he, talk, he, he gets that anger. And, you know, you go into this fantasy land of thinking about what you're going to do when you go down to that door and you're going to kick it in and things like that. But he's not doing that. 
Instead, he's thinking about what does God really want me to do? And we're on this road, we're in this process, and we're doing it together. And we're going to stay on this road until one day we're going to be free from sin completely. Hallelujah. Give your Savior a hand if you want to. He is good. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for justification. Thank you for giving us something that it's a gift. You know, and we think humanly there's sometimes when someone deserves a gift, but with salvation, there's we do not deserve it at all. We can't earn it, but you give it to us, and then you give us the gift of sanctification. And as we walk this road together, God, I pray that we would walk it. Humbly, I pray that we would walk it steadfastly. I pray that we would keep our eyes focused on you. That we keep our eyes on the prize. And Paul said the prize is that when we get to be with you in your fullness. And praise God for that hope. And I pray that everything that we do, God, would be out of obedience from love that just pours out of our hearts for you. And we ask this all in Christ's holy, precious name. Amen. Amen.